Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Since I keep talking about foot picks, I've also started considering switching into ASMR. No, but seriously, today we're going to be talking about load balancing. So for those of you who aren't familiar, typically I recommend balancing your load across many different places. Some people decide to be monogamous with their load, but I recommend spreading it out. It makes life a whole lot simpler. Anyways, let's start going ahead and talking about some systems design. Okay. So, in order to start talking about actual load balancing, what we must first do is talk about horizontal versus vertical scaling. I can't remember if I've mentioned this so far in this refactored series, but uh, in case I haven't, let's go over it quickly. So vertical scaling is pretty simple. The point is, if we've got one node that is particularly slow, rather than make things more complex by putting it over a bunch of different systems, let's just get a more powerful node. So I've got one database, congrats, now I just put it on a better CPU, maybe some more RAM, anything like that. But of course that only works up into a point. And so massive tech companies these days have instead preferred to use commodity hardware alongside horizontal scaling, and that's over here. So we take just one node, and then we scale them out with very similar different types of other nodes in order to basically scale them out. And sometimes, we might end up having to partition if, for example, we're horizontally scaling out a database. If we're just doing this for a bunch of application servers, which are all doing the same thing, then we don't necessarily have to partition, but keep in mind that sometimes it is necessary. Okay, so now let's talk about load balancers a little bit. Because in reality, this is not just a philosophy of how to talk to girls, but in reality, it is something that we use when horizontally scaling. So basically, of course, when we've got a bunch of different more or less identical nodes that we can send our requests to, we want to make sure that none of them are getting overloaded and that none of them are getting starved from doing any work. And this is where our load balancer comes in. So it can actually sit between pretty much any two layers of our application. As you can see right here, we've got a client, we've got some, let's say, app servers, and we've got a load balancer between them. Uh, between the app servers and our caching layer, we're gonna need a load balancer there because which cache are we actually going to? And then finally, between our caching layer and our actual databases themselves, we're also gonna need one more load balancer because again, that request can go to any of those databases. We want to do so intelligently and uh, the load balancer is ultimately gonna help us do that. So let's talk about how. Well, the load balancer is going to basically use a few different types of routing policies in order to send our requests to one of the different nodes. And so basically, um, you know, because we have multiple choices, we need to know where we can actually send them. And so there are a few different algorithms that we can use here, and I would say depending on the situation that some are better than others. So for example, we've got round robin, where basically if this is our load balancer right here, you know, we could send one to this database, two to this next one, three to here, and then we would wrap around, you know, this is request number four. Of course, let's say uh, this node right here is two X is powerful, then uh, before, you know, we do anything else, we would send this guy requests one and two, and then we would send this guy requests three and then four, and then this guy five and six. So that's kind of the concept of weighted round robin. There's also the idea of lowest response time, which is basically just like, you know, keep track on the load balancer of the response time of every single node, keep a running average, uh, which does require actually keeping some state on the load balancer. And then as we kind of get those aggregate metrics, whichever one has had the lowest response time over the last n requests, we can then go ahead and route our message over there. Ideally, the goal then would be that all of our nodes have an equal response time coming back. And then the last concept that we'll talk about, and this is probably the one we'll be using most in reality, is hashing. The reasoning being that we can do smart things with it, and we'll talk about that in a second. So there are two types of hashing that you can do when it comes to load balancing based on the actual message itself, or based on just like what is exposed at the networking layer. So that second option is called layer four. Uh, you know, it's basically load balancing off of things that don't actually require us to do like a full read and decode of the message. Things like the IP address, the protocol, and uh, that's just gonna be faster because again, we don't really need to read the message itself. We're just looking at headers. And then similarly, we've got layer seven, which in this case, we're actually reading the message content, uh, that payload, and that is going to be a little bit slower, but allows us to be more flexible. And sometimes we wanna be intelligently routing our messages. We'll talk about why in a second. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is consistent hashing. And so we've spoken about consistent hashing plenty in the past because basically what it allows us to do 
is it allows us to partition a bunch of you know keys and make sure that when different nodes get added to our cluster and they're taking kind of part of that partition range that the majority of the keys don't actually switch their location. So in the context of load balancing, let's go ahead and think about what that's very useful for. In this case, it's actually really great when we have a local cache on each potential place that we're load balancing to. So let me draw that out quickly. We've got our load balancer, and then we've got three possible servers that we could be talking to, S1, S2, S3, right? And so now let's imagine that I'm coming in, this is Jordan, and I'm making a request and the load balancer sends me to S1, which is an application server, keep in mind, and that's gonna route to the database, which is then going to return an answer. Now being that S1 is a server, it's now going to cache the result of that Jordan call. And so it's very important then that if I were to go and reach out to the load balancer a second time, that I would go and have my request routed back to S1 because that way I'm more likely to hit that cache data on the server. And so in this sense, it is very, very useful when we are basically using a load balancer to perform some type of hashing. And when we are performing some type of hashing, it is much better to use consistent hashing than basically taking the hash of my username and then doing mod n where n is the number of servers. And the reason for this, if you recall, is that as we add servers or as we remove servers, then n becomes either n plus one or n minus one, and that actually shifts the location of every single load balancing result because uh, now we just have modulo a different number. And so instead what we do is consistent hashing where if you recall, we've got basically a ring and this ring represents the whole hash output range and we randomly distribute all of our servers somewhere along the ring. So this is server one, this is server two, this is server three. And basically the, the, the requests or the hash range that go to server one is represented by the entire distance after server one and before server two. And so the reason this is useful is let's say we wanted to add server four over here. Now the only keys that are actually being moved are going to be the ones over here which used to belong to server three, but are now belonging to server four. So they go from three to four. But as you can see, if we were using the hash mod n formula and we added a fourth server, pretty much every single other key would have to be rehashed and that's why consistent hashing is a lot better. So it is definitely an algorithm that we want to be using when load balancing. Okay, the last kind of topic for this video that I would like to talk about today is going to be fault tolerance. So, so far we've discussed load balancers as if there's only a single one at every single point between two layers of our application. And in reality, that's not gonna be the case. Otherwise we would have a single point of failure. So there are generally two types of common approaches to dealing with fault tolerance while load balancing. I will outline them both. The first is called active active load balancing. And the nice thing about this is that because it is effectively us having two active load balancers, we can achieve greater throughput. Our load balancer won't be a bottleneck for our application, or at least it's less likely to do so. At the same time, keep in mind that I've already mentioned throughout the episode that sometimes it is actually useful to keep some state on your load balancer. So for example, if you always want to like take the request and do a routing policy where it is like lowest average response time. The issue of having two of these guys is that, you know, now the local state is divided between two places. We probably don't have as great of a sense of the actual response time. Again, that's not really a huge deal. Active active does make a lot of sense, but this does lead us to the second possible configuration, which is an active passive load balancer where you've got one guy that's active, the other guy that's passive. And when this guy goes down, they're both in communication with Zookeeper. Zookeeper is taking heartbeats, and then the passive load balancer will eventually be able to read from Zookeeper that it thinks the active one is down, and then it in turn can take over and start routing requests to all of these guys. The client can be doing the same. Okay, so let's quickly conclude this video because I am getting tired and want to go to bed. Basically, load balancers, essentially in any horizontal scaling type of situation, are completely essential. Um, you know, this can happen with your app servers, your caches, your databases, and at the end of the day, uh, kind of the one main process to think about here is actually how you want to be routing your request. 
Of course, using something like round robin while basic often still does get the job done. However, if it's a situation where caching is involved and you wanna be sure that the same requests are getting routed to the same servers every single time to maximize your cache hits, then something like consistent hashing on a layer four or a layer seven level of data is probably the way to go for you. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.